Hi, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me as I bring you the latest research and updates about what's happening with COVID-19. A lot of what I say is challenging for many people who are following a narrative, but from a scientific point of view, the more we understand, the better prepared we can be. It seems that uh, Dr. Fossey has gotten COVID again. I just recently seen this on social media, so I was trying to corroborate whether or not this was accurate. I'll pay you the clip that I have seen, and you can look and research it for yourself. This is after six doses, or is it six boosters? I can't remember where they are up to at the moment, but this stuff is relevant, and we need to understand what exactly is happening, and is it relevant that the, the disease at the moment seems to be mild? Well, what I'll be showing you is going to be added to this paper, and I'll show you this in a second, which is how the SARS-CoV-2 variants diverge, divergently infect and damage cardiomyocytes, this is heart muscle, in vitro and in vivo. This is not so to be underestimated, and this is part of the reason why I'm focused on it, and I hope that even Dr. Fossey would look at this research and not underestimate what we could be facing in the near future. Part of my work has always been to try and find solutions. And one of the ones that I've been focused on quite recently is to do with omega-3s. I strongly believe in it largely because of my own personal experience. But if you want to learn more information, please, there's a link to go to this landing page. All you have to do is sign up and you'll be able to get this video where I share some of information from my COVID storm presentation. And I have lots of information here generally about uh, omega-3s, really, really important information that is relevant to everyone. So please make sure you join us in this journey. But getting back to the situation now, what exactly is happening in terms of uh, Dr. Fossey? Let's just hear, I've got a clip here, and let's just hear what he had to say. This was done where, this was done by uh, the McCullough Foundation, where they took a clip from 2021 and played a more recent clip, put them together uh, to highlight a particular point. Let's just listen to uh, what was said at that time. When people are vaccinated, they can feel safe that they are not going to get infected. I got infected about two weeks ago. It was my third infection, and I had been vaccinated and boosted a total of six times. When people are vaccinated, they can feel safe that they are not going to get infected. I got infected about two weeks I think one of the things that stands out for me here, and I, I was just reflecting on it, and I don't know if it's relevant, but I'll, I'll slide this along so that you see it. But when I look at 2021 compared to 2024, and you can see this here, uh, I was just looking at the here, uh, this area here, slightly grayed um, with, uh, you know, standard. He's looked like this for a number of years. But when I slide it along here, this looks very different. And um, now that may just be coincidental. Maybe he was dying his hair. Or is this part of the, Im the damage that can occur in the context of recurring COVID infections and the immune problems that can occur as well? So part of the, the question is, is that I think they were making the highlight that they had the thinking in 2021 that this was the case, it would protect people but they realized afterwards that it was designed to prevent severe disease. Um, that wasn't the aim in the initial studies to prevent infection, but people didn't know that. And so therefore much of the low risk cohort went ahead to get it thinking that it protected against infection. Um, that I think is a very significant point that we need to come back to at a different time. But the bigger question is, does the mild infection, is it even relevant? People are not getting severe COVID-19, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated as much. Um, does it matter? Is it just a little bit of a cold? This is how a lot of people are looking at it. Well, when I go back to this paper here and I look at what it was saying, and I'll go through this in a little bit more detail, 
they were looking, and this paper was published here, you can see this, 2nd of August 2024, so relatively recently. And uh, this was looking um, at the cardiac complications that are associated with poor prognosis and increased mortality. And they were looking at how different variants differ in their infectivity. So a very important perspective that I think I was very interested in understanding and I think should be valuable for you as well. I've got the PDF here and I've just highlighted uh, a few points that I think are relevant. So this is the same paper here and uh, it's showing you the, uh, the points in a little bit more detail. So I've highlighted here what they said about the different variants exhibiting different tropism or ability to infect different kinds of cells and the mechanism of viral entry and the pathology in the heart. And they found that Omicron BA 2.1 was the most efficient at infecting and injuring cardiomyocytes, that CM, in vitro and in vivo. So that's both in the lab and in real, um, real world infections with animals. And it also induced expressions, changes consistent with increased cardiac dysfunction. Now, this is, this is quite relevant and it, it fits with even what happened in the Olympics where Lyles was doing the 200 meter. He was the favorite. He had COVID a few days before and he wasn't at his peak performance. Now, that could just be the viral infection and interferon triggering some kind of response that makes you a bit more fatigued. But it also could represent the potential damage that could occur with regards to the heart and therefore just taking away some of his uh, ability to perform at the highest level. I'm going to take you through some slides as usual with regards to the heart that I think are valuable so that you understand the relevance of the paper in terms of these cardiomyocytes. So, here are some slides to take you through. This is just the heart cut section, the layers of the heart. Outside you have this pericardial sac. This is like a bag that the heart sits in. This is the myocardium, the heart muscle, and the inside lining, the endocardium of the heart. This is a typical setup of the heart. <clears throat> and in the heart, you have these cardiac myocytes. This is what they would look like. And uh, these muscle cells, each one of these is a muscle cell. This represents the mitochondria. They have very high amounts of mitochondria in them to make energy. And they're connected um, by these intercalated discs so that electricity can pass easily between them. So stimulating one stimulates all. This is how the heart muscle will contract. And this is what would happen if in case there was inflammation in the heart, you would have um, different immune cells coming in and this can then lead to fibrosis and the damage of the, the heart muscle. So all very important information for us to be able to, to look at. But what does that mean in terms of the Omicron variant? Because part of the problem that I have is that people are underestimating the Omicron infections. They say it's mild, and so therefore it's not a big issue. My view is that you have to protect your upper airways from the virus penetrating it. Because once the virus penetrates your mucosal immunity, what you then end up with is what I call viral sepsis. And the viral sepsis just means that you've got circulating viral particles in the bloodstream, and then they can infect cells in the endothelium and in this case, they can then go on to infect the heart muscle cells. Now, the reason this is so critical is because of how Omicron differs from the other variants. And so when we look at the cellular entry mechanisms here, this is a, a slide taken from 2022 Nature Reviews of uh, the Molecular Cell Biology in terms of mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2 entry. There are two ways that the virus can enter. This was the way for the original variants all the way up to Delta. They would bind here to ACE2, and they also had this um, protein here, this enzyme TMPRSS, which would then cleave the spike protein, cause fusion, and release the viral RNA. Very efficient mechanism for the virus to infect. 
And this is how the original variant um, did it. For some reason, well, I, I think it's not for some reason. What then happened is that one of the, the most significant antibodies uh, that were produced after vaccination targeted this part in terms of this interaction with TMPRSS. I think this is one of the reasons why the Omicron variants were driven, because what then happened is the um, the virus ends up using a backdoor. This tend hit in this case it binds to ACE two, forms an endosome which goes inside the cell. The endosome then has to be acidified, and therefore the uh, the capsule breaks up and then it releases the viral RNA. So it's a slower process, but clearly much more efficient. It's quite interesting that this is one of the ways that hydroxychloroquine actually works to block this by blocking endosomal acidification. That's a bit more controversial, but the point being is that this is exactly the mechanism that hydroxychloroquine uses in autoimmune diseases by interfering with the endosomal acidification. So the fact that the virus uses this mechanism, especially Omicron, is suggestive uh, that it could be beneficial, but inconvenient from a scientific point of view. That's a separate issue. But the point being is that that entry mechanism for the virus means that it doesn't need the TMPRSS, so it can infect different cells. So when we get back to the research here, what it was then showing, and this is the point that, this is the reason I went through that, is that when you then go back to the research paper, it demonstrates this exactly this point, increased infectivity of Omicron BA2 is attributed to its ability to infect via endocytosis independently of TMPRSS2 which is absent in cardiomyocytes. So what they were saying here is that in effect, the Omicron variants, because it doesn't need to use this, can infect directly with any cell that just has ACE2. Now, this TMPRSS was primarily in the lungs, and this is why we got severe lung disease with especially the Delta variant. But because Omicron doesn't use this, it doesn't spread as efficiently to the lungs. And so therefore we don't see a significant lung disease. And this is a mistake people make to say, well, that means that the virus is less virulent. No, it's just about the what it infects. So the problem we have now is that the virus will more likely break through the mucosal immune system, especially in, it seems, in vaccinated cohorts, become a circulate in the, um, in the bloodstream, and then be able to affect or infect any cell that has T and um, that has just ACE2 on it. So this is part of the reason why Omicron doesn't cause a severe lung disease, but it also means that it can infect multiple cells in terms of its um, replication inside the body. When we look at the um, the the application of that, and uh, this is when they were they were studying the different uh, infection capabilities of these different um, viruses. And you can see here, this is BA1, D is Delta, Mock is just the control, and BA2. And you can see here that BA2 was the most efficient at infecting uh, cells that just have ACE2. Look at the difference between BA2 and Delta here. So this suggests that BA2 is very, is very effective at infecting cells that have ACE2 on them. And this is separate and apart of the fact that it doesn't need to do this in the context of the lungs. And therefore, what we are looking at is that this infection causes damage to the heart. Now, the other part of this is that when you look at when, what happens with regards to mitochondria, and this is now showing mitochondrial fragmentation, and again, mock, this is delta, BA1, BA2, you can see BA2 is the most efficient at damaging the mitochondria, and this will have a direct impact on the heart and the brain that use high levels of mitochondria to produce energy. And so this is part of the reason why you will probably see the effects of Omicron more likely to target brain and heart anywhere that has high levels of mitochondria 
or use of mitochondria are more likely to be affected. And that's known the problem is because this is far more subtle. You know, you may be talking about a small drop off in percentage of function of heart muscle. So Lyles was still able to run the 200 meters and finish it, not as efficiently. But what happens in somebody who is borderline heart failure and they then get an Omicron infection because you then have the damage to the heart that can occur. And what I was looking at here, and you have to remember that what's happening is that the virus is infecting these cells. And then if you have a normal immune system, this is what would then happen. So these normal cells, so this is showing you a cell that gets infected by a virus, starts replicating. And what happens is that the cell knows to make every protein that it's making, puts it on the surface so that when these um, lymphocytes come along and check, if they find a cell that has abnormal proteins, it kills them. And so this is then what happens is that it has virally infected cell. This no lymphocyte comes along, destroys this infected cell, and that's what you have. The, the problem here is that this scar that would normally rep be replaced in other tissues is not so easily replaced in the heart. And so then you will be ending up with multiple areas of scarring in different parts of the heart. I think that's pretty significant and it shouldn't be underestimated, which is why I predicted this heart failure epidemic that we, we're gonna have, it has, has started already, and it's only going to accelerate as we have more and more Omicron infections occurring. I think this is pretty serious. I don't think it should be underestimated. And I think we need to find as many solutions as possible that can impact on it. And this is why, as I said, if you're listening to what I'm talking about, I am trying to find solutions. I can't guarantee that every solution will work. But one of the solutions, as I said, that I am very focused on, it's part of my personal protocol is omega-3s. And if you are interested in that, make sure to use the link to go to the landing page. We want you to sign up. That's your exchange. I'm giving you some really good information. Please sign up for the newsletter and further updates. This is a quite a relevant point. So this is one of the mechanisms that I think is important. And I've been looking at all the ways that we can settle down the immune system to minimize this damage that is likely to occur, occur in the longer run. So the point being is that Omicron seems to target cells that any cell that has ACE2, and a lot of it would be heart, kidneys, brain. What then happens is that it damages mitochondria. The damage to the mitochondria makes these um, organs less efficient. And so therefore in organs that need more energy, you're likely to find that they have more issues in the longer term. This is a big challenge ahead of us. And whatever anyone may say, I don't think this should be ignored. I think we can hope for the best, but from everything that I'm seeing in the research and clinically, we need to prepare for the worst. Let's see if we can find ways to mitigate this damage and protect those and our loved ones around us. Have a great evening.